everybody. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Um, I am delighted to be here with you for another Facebook Live Q&A. Um, if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to get so that I can see your comments and questions real quick here, and then we will jump right in to the topics at hand. I know some of you are joining us from the local uh, Colorado Lyme group that I spoke at last Saturday. Um, and so if you have your questions, you are more than welcome to join me here and ask away. I look forward to that. And give me just a second. I want to be sure and see your news feed as I'm going here. So I'm just getting set up for that um, so that I can actually see your comments and questions and everything here. Okay, so um, good. Okay, so I can see your comments and questions and anything you want to um, bring here. So say hello. Tell me where you're from if you're listening live. If you're local, tell me if you're from the Lyme um, the Lyme Summit that was recently last Saturday held. I think we had Dr. Forescano, myself. I can't remember who the other speakers were, but um, look forward to talking to you. And uh, hi, Rada. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, please say hello. Tell us where you're from. Um, just a little housekeeping, and then we'll just jump in. I will probably just jump into some random topic, and then I'll watch for some questions. Um, maybe we'll start with some Lyme disease topics, since I know I have some listeners. And hi, from Houston, Rada. Hi, Cindy, from Pennsylvania. Yeah, keep jumping in there. Tell us where you're from and say hello. Um, so first, just a little housekeeping. Um, if you don't follow me on Instagram, you're missing out. I um, show all the candid shots. I was just in LA last weekend for a photo shoot of all things, getting ready for next year. We're going to um, launch a documentary and a book all about environmental toxicity, mold-related illness, Lyme disease. So stay tuned because you can follow me there for candid photos and different things about what's happening. And what I really try to do on Instagram, it's just Dr. Jill Carnahan. Um, go there and, and hit um, follow. You're going going to see um, little memes of some of the articles I do. And I don't know about you, but I actually love how the Instagram, you can make this, you know, simple little photo of a recipe. And it's kind of like with one shot, you can see what the whole article is about. And most of us anymore, we have a hard, harder time of reading the whole article or sitting down for a whole book, sadly. But if you um, enjoy those memes, I've got lots of them there for you. Um, you can go to jillcarnahan.com for free content. We've got all the videos and blogs and articles that I've ever done are almost all on the website there. So you can find recipes, you can find blogs. I put out weekly um, content ideas. Um, hi, Donna. Hi, Danielle. Um, thank you, Rada. Um, for your congratulations. And so there's tons of free content there. And if you're not part of my free newsletter, I'll put a link in the um, in the comments after I'm done, but feel free to join the newsletter. You'll get all kinds of free content there too. And um, I don't come here to mention products, but if we do talk about someone asks about products or what to use for this or that, you can find all of those at drjillhealth.com. So those are the main places where you can find me. And um, thank you, Cindy. So uh, please feel free to type in your questions. You're live with Dr. Jill, and I am here just to answer any questions that you might have. I can see the feed. So um, I will jump right into that as you guys start scrolling down the questions. Usually it starts a little slow, and then towards the end, it's just questions that I can't even get to all of them. Um, but let's start just a little bit with um, Lyme disease. Um, you know, uh, recently there's a celebrity um, who came out, Ryan Sutter, with his diagnosis on all the ma major news outlets this week and his diagnosis of Lyme disease and mold toxicity. I encourage you, if you haven't read any of those articles or seen Trista Sutter's podcast called Better Etc., um, check that out. You'll hear his story, and I think it'll resonate with a lot of you out there um, with your journeys if you've had um, Lyme disease or mold toxicity. What I see more and more is in functional medicine, this toxic load and infectious burden are such a problem with so many of our patients. Um, and it's only getting worse because of our environmental toxic load and because more buildings being airtight and some of the toxic molds that are growing indoors. And so many of you I know understand this and have suffered. If you have any questions about either one of those, please feel free to ask and I'll do my very best to answer. Um, if you were at the Lyme Summit, I talked about kind of an overview of some of the infectious and toxic, toxic things and how they relate to one another. Um, one thing in particular, 
a lot of people think of endemic areas and they're, you know, the East Coast, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, maybe Wisconsin, Michigan, a little bit into Illinois, Florida, uh, California on the coast. But what we're seeing is really all of the United States are having more um, incidences of tick-borne infections. And part of that is because um, there are you know, other types of infections besides just plain old Borrelia. One in particular is called tick-borne relapsing fever, TBRF for short. And uh, our typical Western blot on LabCorp or Quest or most of those labs uh, doesn't test for tick-borne relapsing fever. So I find a lot of patients can present, especially out here in the mid in the West, so Colorado, Utah, um, even down to Texas, where this is more common. They'll present with a tick-like um, infection, so they may have joint pain and fatigue and symptoms that came on after a bite or, or after exposure to horses or dogs or someone that was uh, had a lot of some animal that had a lot of ticks on it and um, they will have tick-borne relapsing fever. And right now I recommend Igenix as a lab because they're the only ones really testing for the subclasses and the species of tick-borne relapsing fever. And I've seen a lot more of that, especially since I see patients in Colorado. Um, so that's an interesting thing and you will not see that positive if you do a typical Western blot from any of the conventional labs. Um, so tick-borne infections, super common. Um, what I find is often in a moldy environment, the um, mold will weaken the immune system and old infections like viral infections, um, cold sores or herpes viruses, chickenpox will pop up as shingles or uh, tick-borne infections like Borrelia, Babesia, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, they will pop up and start to affect that patient's health because of the weakened immune system. So these two definitely go hand in hand. So I'm seeing some questions. Hi, Connie, what's your recommendation for long COVID? 21 year old inflammation in hands, fingers, knees, PMF or something else. So the neat thing about long COVID, it's, if there's any neat thing, that's a terrible way to start, right? Cause it's not a neat thing, but the mechanism of what happens here is not new to functional medicine. So this just happens to be a very inflammatory virus that triggers immune inflammation and cytokine response. But we've seen this for the past 10 to 20 years in functional medicine. We've seen it with Epstein-Barr. We've seen it with Coxsackie virus. We've seen it with um, CMV. We've seen it with herpes viruses, varicella, and all kinds of viruses and even other infections where they trigger this inflammatory immune response of cytokines and that becomes somewhat activated. So these patients are chronically inflamed. And um, the key there is decreasing the cytokine um, inflammation. So the first thing I would do is support with anti- um, with, er, with nutrients that would support the system, the immune system. Some nutrients that are key in being supportive to the immune system would be vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D, um, N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, and a B vitamin, those would be all core. Um, the other things that you'd wanna do are support the inflammatory cytokine response. Um, the things that could be supportive here would be like turmeric, boswellia, quercetin, um, I also really like Chinese skullcap. Uh, we have a couple products, one called Cytoblox, C-Y-T-O-B-L-O-X, that I really like for that cytokine inflammation. Um, and that dose is about two twice a day, depending on the, the person and age, uh, super helpful for inflammation. And then um, anything with turmeric, like super turmeric um, is fantastic. It's a full um, curcuminoid uh, oil base, really like that product, super turmeric. Um, and anything with Boswellia, I'm a huge fan of Boswellia, resveratrol, quercetin. So we have histocyst, which has quercetin and bromelain in it. Um, we have plain Boswellia. Um, we have Dr. H Rejoint, which has a combination of products for joint pain and inflammation. So any of these kinds of things can be helpful. And then I typically would have them do a very anti-inflammatory diet free of gluten, of dairy, of sugar at the very least, because you don't want to add that inflammation. It's not that the foods are causing the issue, but you want to just take away that burden in case gluten does contribute to the inflammation in the body. Um, plenty of sleep is really critical. Sleep is when we recharge and our livers have the chance to detoxify and uh, our immune systems have that chance to restore. So essential seven to eight hours of good quality sleep is absolutely key. Sleep is one of those things that I start with with patients because if that's not working, nothing else is working. The healing can't happen. So sleep is really essential. So those are just some of the things that I would do in supporting the long haulers, very similar to other infections. Um, hi, Donna, do you have any resources for severe diverticulosis? So diverticulosis is um, outpouchings in the uh, lumen of the gut, so usually in the colon, where there's little tiny pouches that have been 
by pressure. So your gut lumen say it's supposed to be kind of a flat surface. It's almost like if there were seeds and nuts and things um, and, and causing this outpouching. And so these pockets can get debris that uh, coalesces in there and then there's infection because that doesn't move. So whenever anything like that is stagnant, then it can get stuck seeds or nuts or, or bacterial rem remnants or things or stool. And then um, that becomes inflamed because it's stuck there and it's not moving through the colon. So uh, first thing is diverticulosis is just the pockets that exist in the colon if someone has this, but diverticulitis is inflammation or infection in those pockets. So if you just have diverticulosis, um, it can be hard to completely reverse that. But the ways I would start are a, a healthy fiber, um, anti-inflammatory diet. I would probably recommend a low glycemic, um, maybe minimal grain, at least gluten-free, sugar-free, dairy-free, probably corn, soy, alcohol, sugar, all of those out, maybe egg, maybe peanut. Those are all kind of the common inflammatory foods. And to eat a real um, uh, a diet that's low in inflammation, I would make sure there's probiotics on board, like spore probiotics. I like Megaspore. Um, I like HU58. Um, some of these really great probiotics are helpful. And then um, making sure that you have a low, grade, low inflammation and that you're treating any bacterial dysbiosis. Bacterial dysbiosis could be treated by a daily berberine. Berberine is also good metabolically, but it tends to have an antimicrobial effect. But you could use something else like grapefruit seed extract or garlic or something else. And I would probably do a stool test and an organic acid test to determine if there's any dysbiosis that needs to be treated, because that will probably be an inflammatory trigger for someone to develop diverticulitis. Now, if someone's in acute diverticulitis, which is that inflammation of those little pockets in the colon, um, antibiotics are very appropriate because this can be very, very, cause a lot of illness. It could even cause a rupture of the colon. So um, the typical antibiotics that are used are ciprofloxin and um, metronidazole. Those are heavy hitters. So I don't go to those easily. Like I may try berberine if the patient's not septic and they're stable and they're just minimally inflamed, but typically antibiotics are needed in the acute phase because it can be very, very serious. So that'd be something you need to talk to your doctor about. You'd want to, um, you know, not, this is not medical advice. You want to uh, get your doctor's advice and treat that or go to the emergency room if that's happening. Okay. Let's see what else. We got some more questions coming in. Um, Hi, Carol. Do we get gastroenterologists to become, oh, how do we get them to become educated? Three major groups with dozens of doctors and everyone is clueless to MCAS, mastocytic enterocolitis, and they don't have time to get elevated. Severe attacks put on budesonide. I can't tolerate um, steroids, working with dietitian. But thanks for sharing your little bits on the, the history. That's super helpful, Carol. And thanks for sharing it publicly too, because uh, I'm sure there's other people suffering. So gosh, this is a tough thing because one of my goals in life with the documentary and book and, and just speaking and teaching is how do we really educate other physicians and get more um, physicians on board so that US patients have the option and have more patients, have more doctors who really understand. So that's definitely one of my missions and I'll keep doing everything I can to educate my colleagues um, because you really have to, we're taught in medical school to get to a diagnosis and then stop there because that's the answer, right? As a functional doctor, that's where I start because the next question is why? Why did this happen? Why did this patient go down this path? And what can I do to reverse it? And I think, Carol, that's what you're talking about there is the difference is someone really questioning, being a good detective and trying to help you find answers. And I know as a patient, it's got to be so frustrating sometimes because um, these doctors, you know, again, I love my colleagues and there's so many brilliant, amazing doctors out there, but some of them... Um, haven't really had that inquisitive curiosity to help you find answers. And especially some of these lesser known mass, uh, mass cell issues and things, if they're not, um, you know, really looking into that, they may miss it. So I think you just become educated. You can become an advocate, um, see other physicians if needed, get second, third, fourth opinions. Uh, I remember when I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, this was um, 20 years ago. I sat with my gastroenterologist and he said, Jill, um, this is lifelong. There's no cure. Um, we're going to start steroids and or I want you to start steroids. I actually didn't do that. Um, you're probably going to need multiple surgeries. This is lifelong. It's incurable and diet has nothing to do with it. Yeah. And I sat there and I thought, gosh, I don't know a lot. I'm just a third year medical student, but that doesn't feel right to me. And so just like I was a patient, just like you were, I was just a medical student and it didn't feel right. And I fired him and didn't go back. And I went on my own journey to try to find answers. And I found Elaine Gottschall specific carbohydrate diet, which at the time was touted to be able to help with Crohn's and colitis. And I thought, what do I have to lose? 
and I went on the diet gluten-free and specific carbohydrate free. And my symptoms were um, almost completely resolved in two weeks. Now, I always say I wasn't cured. It took several years to get the microbiome balanced and to really feel like I consider myself completely cured from Crohn's disease, no evidence, no symptoms. However, it took uh, several years, but diet did have something to do with it. And it was the start of me understanding how powerful diet is, but I had to become just like you, my own advocate and decide who I would trust and who I would not and what kind of opinion I would seek. So I just encourage you guys to do the same because you're in charge um, and you can continue to seek opinions if you don't find what you're looking for and uh, trust your intuition. There was this piece of me that thought, that doesn't sound right. I can't imagine that diet doesn't have anything to do with this. And so I trusted that piece of my intuition and I went and I found diet does have a lot to do with it. So Carol, good luck to you. That's a tough thing. And I totally understand. Curtis, um, for those are, are cash limited due to Lyme and mold, do you know of affordable education sources so that we can know what's happening and explain to others? Um, Love that you have a thank you for your kind words, Curtis. You know, that's one reason I come on here. I'm not getting paid to do this. I'm just doing it because I love talking to you, um, feeling like I'm somewhat connected, even though it's virtually and trying to give more information and be there in some way. Um, it's one reason if you haven't been to my YouTube channel, we have like 60 plus videos with experts. Again, I just do that for free because you can go listen to those all day long. There's like 60 plus hours of interviews. And I've literally brought some of the world's experts in Lyme and mold on my show because it's great information that should be public. So go there, that's all free. You might be able to find if you just search by the topics or by the doctor. Um, there's lots and lots of videos on Lyme and mold and you can share those with family members. There's one with Dr. Richard Horowitz, done one with Dr. Dan Kindelier, both on Lyme. There's another with Dr. Mary Ackerley and gosh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but lots and lots of interviews on mold and Lyme. And some, I think sometimes that helps if friends or family or people in your life don't understand what's going on, um, you can go there. And part of my goal with book documentary and the things that are coming is to really, really bring the word to the public and help them to understand um, some of you and how you've suffered and other patients who might not have answers. Um, so I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And thank you, Donna. Um, Taylor, hey, Taylor, uh, do you know any good coffee enemas? Yes. Um, so this is hilarious because I do have one on my store and I'll tell you why and why I'm even mentioning it here for you guys. So I went to Switzerland, um, before COVID and, um, I was there at a Swiss mountain retreat for a liver detox. And it was just one of the most ex uh, spectacular experiences I'd ever had. Just absolutely amazing. And, um, the detox went really well. Um, I was one of the youngest people there. It was actually a lot of people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and they all did so well in this detoxification program. And I was always like, how are these patients who are not super healthy and certainly not super young doing so well? Well, part of the protocol there was one time during that week of detox, a uh, colon hydrotherapy treatment, but more than that, it was daily coffee enemas. And in Switzerland, they had these wonderful little kits that were self-contained, super easy to use. You used an instant charcoal co coffee um, that you put into a bottle, fill it with the warm, clean tap water, shake it up, add the tube, and there you have it. So much easier than the things we could have gotten in the U.S. with the hang the bag, filter the coffee, cool the coffee. So all that to say, I have those in our store. They're imported from Switzerland, guys. So these are directly from the Swiss Mountain Clinic. I'm going to put a link in the uh, feed here so you can see it, Taylor. But I'm a huge fan of this because it's so easy. It makes it super, super easy. Um, when you get the kit, you get the uh, order. I put the link in there that has the coffee with it. So you have the kit plus the coffee, but you can get them separately. That uh, coffee uh, does about 21 um, uh, enemas. So you can use that if you use it a couple times a week. It'll last you a long time. Um, I'm a huge fan because this will increase your glutathione production by about 600% and very gentle, very safe. Um, and the instructions and everything are included in there. So I put that link in the bottom here if you're interested in knowing more. Hey, Ben, um, physicians often do not treat empirically or order the proper test in the acute phase. What's your recommendation for testing once a suspected bacterial infection reaches a chronic phase or maybe more elusive outside the uh, circulatory system? Ben, this is such a great question, and it really shows your insight into understanding how this works, because often, even with some of the best tests like Igenix, we're testing um, immunoglobulins, so we're checking the immune reaction to an infection, and there are docs who, especially if you get an IgG reaction, so IgM goes up first in the first six to eight weeks, that usually goes down, and then IgG will go up and stay up, so if you had varicella at five years old, even in my age, you're still going to have 
titers of varicella that are high for IgG. Um, if you had COVID, that depends a little less um, long lasting in some cases, but the IgG may stay high for a while. So a lot of times when you test like for Borrelia or Bartonella or Babesia, these IgG levels, docs may say, well, how do we know that those are accurate for acute infection? Um, and this can be tricky. There are, gosh, this could be a whole lecture and it's really complex. I still like a Western blot for uh, Bartonella, Babesia, Borrelia, et cetera, but there are more accurate testing such as PCR and FISH that's in situ hybridization, which actually detects through a highlighted like fluorescent uh, tab or tag, it detects the actual bacteria in the blood. So for real accuracy, I often do FISH and PCR, and those can be done by conventional labs and also by things like Igenix. And usually you can get to a determination. Viruses are tricky because um, you can just see titers. And again, you don't know if it's past or current, but I think one of the governing organizations talks about titers that are four times the normal limits being a positive. And I usually use that as kind of a guideline. So if a patient has a clinical picture that looks like a viral infection, plus a titer that's four times the normal limits, that's the direction I'll usually go for a positive um, viral test. But as you well know, Ben, um, it can be a really tricky thing to diagnose. Hi, Danielle. First diagnosed with mold illness, black mold. Had an evaluation on my house and I'm currently not living. After a year of treatment, lifestyle changes, no improvement. Just diagnosed with Lyme, tick-borne bacteria. Keep, take, keep hearing that it takes a long time to heal from these. How do you know when long enough with a treatment and what to look for something else? Oh gosh, these are great questions and things I deal with every day in the clinic with patients. So for Lyme, first of all, you've uh, described Danielle that there was mold toxicity. I'm suspecting mold toxicity weakened your immune system and allowed these other infections to start to pop up and cause problems. So one of the things, um, funny, I just got doing done doing an interview for a mycotoxin summit with Dr. Eric Gordon. Um, and we were talking about this very issue because what happens is that mold in the environment will weaken your immune system and old infections will tend to pop up and cause problems. And if you start with detox and really get out of the environment, clean up the mold, get your immune system back online and healthy, sometimes you don't need to be aggressive on the infections. Um, and that's important. So I would not jump to antibiotics first until you're sure that the mold detox has been successful. Um, and then when you are treating Lyme or co-infections, there's multiple routes. There's a lot of herbal routes. And if the patient agrees, sometimes I'll start with those. Um, I think they're less effective for full eradication, but depending on the doses that can happen. Um, the problem is with herbal routes, at least in my experience, it's more common to have someone stay on the drops and they feel great, but if they go off the drops, they can relapse. So sometimes they're stuck, not really stuck, but they're on the drops, they feel amazing, but if they go off the drops, they don't always maintain that level of success. Uh, but again, that's where the immune system comes in because if you can support the immune system, you usually have a lot more success long-term. That's the drops. Antibiotics, I don't love antibiotics, but in some cases it can be absolutely powerful game changer if you know how to use them. I do use antibiotics in patients. That's typically a four to six months treatment or longer. And what I always want to do is within six to eight weeks, have some progress, some turnaround. I won't keep pushing if I don't see progress of some sort. So I'm constantly checking in with the patients and making sure that they're having some sort of progress before I push um, the antibiotics. Okay. Um, Misty, do you recommend a diet for ulcerative colitis? Yes. So um, specific carbohydrate diet has a real good success rate. And um, that's a great place if you don't know where to start. Um, I've had a lot of success with that, with especially with ulcerative colitis, maybe even more so than Crohn's disease. So I think that's a fantastic way to start. I think diet is crucial as a starting point with Crohn's and colitis. So the answer is yes. Yes, yes. Hey, Emily, thanks for jump, jumping in here. I hope you're doing well. Thoughts on neurofeedback. I am a huge fan of these somatic behavioral types of therapies because so often with chronic illness, many of you listening understand this. Um, it, can be, um, it can be so hard. It can make us feel hopeless or isolated or there's lots of emotions that come up. And so dealing with not only that limbic activation, which is a trauma response to illness, um, but also our programming around illness. So um, neuro-linguistic programming, neurofeedback, um, buteco breathing or any sort of breath work, um, yoga, tai chi, movement work, walking, being in nature. 
I'm a huge fan of the PEMF mats. You can, you've heard me talk about it. My mat lies right here and I use it every day. In fact, I was recently in LA and I took a travel mat with me because I didn't want to be one day without it. The higher dose now makes a travel mat. So I'll have to put a link in there too, for you guys, for the coupon, if you want to know about that, because it was awesome to have that on my trip. I used it every day that I was gone. So PMF, um, and then somatic behavioral therapies, like thought field therapy, um, brain spotting, um, EMDR, any sort of therapy where you're touching base with your somatic system and trying to reprogram that fear and that fight or flight and that trauma response. All those things are super helpful. Um, sound therapy, biurnal beats, um, thought, let's see, uh, e, uh, EMDR I mentioned already, I'm trying to think of all the things I haven't mentioned. DNRS with Annie Hopper can be helpful. And um, Gupta program, those are two uh, dynamic neural retraining programs as well. So lots and lots and lots of things you can do. Um, uh, for the limbic system and really, really critical when you've had a chronic illness, there's a trauma response and you need to address that as well to get well. So thanks for asking that, Emily. Neurofeedback is also super important. Do I work with children? Absolutely, 100%. Um, here in Colorado, Dr. Suzanne Godza does work with pan and pandas. She's a neurologist that's functional medicine trained. Um, if you're anywhere near Indiana, my friend um, Ellen Antoine and her husband Scott do work with pan and pandas. So they're a great uh, resource there. Um, and you can always message me here. I can check in later and um, you can search um, icigroup.org. So I-S-E-A-I.org has doctors that are trained in mold and Lyme. And that's a great resource. Um, IFM.org is just functional medicine trained doctors. So those are two places where you could go and search by zip code for, um, for someone who could help you. Thank you, Gianna, Gianni, bless your heart. <laughs> um, what do you do with high IgM levels? Rumi is clue, clueless. Okay, so IgM is one of the immunoglobulins and if they're high, we can see subclasses of IgM, IgG, IgA, any of those could be high or low. Um, I actually see that commonly with Bartonella and Lyme disease. So the first thing I would do is rule out an infection that's contributing to this dysplastic syndrome. However, um, even though that's probably not an early dysplastic, like early kind of myelo, we call a myelodysplastic syndrome, they're almost like a precancer of the bone marrow. You would want to see a doctor to rule that out because it's possible that it's a myelodysplastic syndrome. So if you've ruled that out with hematology, then you can assume it could be infection and start testing. But I also wouldn't assume that it's not um, myelodysplastic in nature. Um, I would rule that out first because you want to make sure it's not one of those conditions. Uh, Rada, how do you diagnose MCAS? Um, so I have a great article on MCAS in my blog. Um, I'm going to try to find that because if I wait till later, I'll forget to add this to this for you guys. So I'm going to do that while I'm talking. Um, there's actually quite a few. If you just search my blog and MCAS, you will find all of them. But there's one that really outlines it for you and um, super helpful. So how do you diagnose? Well, clinically. So all the symptoms of MCAS which are usually histamine related. There's a list in this article that I'll share. And then um, you can do labs, um, which are listed there too, like tryptase, um, urine prostaglandins um, and histamine in the blood. But sometimes people will not come back positive for those and they'll still have MCAS. So I'm putting a link to this article right here in the feed. So we've I've just got a few more minutes today, but I'm gonna get as many questions as I can in. I hope I'm not talking too fast for you. Um, okay, what are some of the best practices get the basics foundations right for supporting general metabolic health, health and immune system in particularly? Okay, foundational stuff. So we'll talk about that. And testing for Lyme if it's been undiagnosed. Okay, so um, foundational. So the first thing is sleep. So getting a good night's sleep, absolutely critical. Um, and so many things you can do for that. As far as nutrients, um, melatonin, 5-HTP, Theanine, GABA can all be helpful. Um, I find somewhat of a ritual, if you have a practice you do every night, can be super helpful getting your body kind of ready to wind down and go to bed. I usually make a cup of hot ginger tea with lemon, um, sometimes mango ginger or lemon ginger, whatever I have on hand. And then I will take a hot Epsom salt bath 
almost every night. And it's this wonderful ritual I have that just calms my body down. I have a weighted blanket, a 20 pound weighted blanket. Um, I think gravity is the company. There's a ton of other great ones out there. Um, and I love my weighted blanket. It's like calming to my nervous system. I never in a million years, I kind of laughed at it um, a couple of years ago and until I got one and I love my weighted blanket. Um, I use my PEMF mat before bed on level one, which is the Schumann frequency. It's like the earth's surface and it really enhances your deep sleep. I've seen an objective in my aura ring, a change in the amount of deep sleep I'm getting. So those are just my rituals um, that I do before bed. And I sleep really wonderful, really deeply. Uh, I have no trouble sleeping, but I know for some of you that have trouble sleeping, that's a foundational issue. So get that right first. Um, diet, diet, we can't ignore. And I think a clean diet is absolutely foundational as well. And it doesn't always move the needle on your lime or your mold, but it's such a foundational issue to make sure that at least you have the good nutrients and you have the inflammation down. So no gluten, no dairy, no sugar. Those are kind of non-negotiables. Often I'll also have people go off any allergens like peanut, egg, soy, corn, um, and alcohol. So that's kind of the, the anti-inflammatory diet, the more extreme versions, which some people need to do are like an autoimmune diet or an autoimmune paleo diet, which would be legume free, grain free for paleo and nuts and seed free for uh, autoimmune paleo. I don't think everybody has to go to that extreme. It just depends on how leaky your gut is, what situation you're in and nutrients. Oh gosh. I could spend an hour on nutrients at the basics. You know, I'm not even always a huge fan of multivitamins because I like to individualize the treatment for the patients because they may need more of this B, less of this nutrient. But at the very minimum, you want minerals and you want B vitamin. Most people need extra zinc and magnesium. Um, if you're postmenopausal, you may need zinc plus copper, um, but many people need more zinc than copper. You just want to check those ratios. Selenium can be key for thyroid function for making glutathione. I'm a huge fan of liver support and acetylcysteine, um, glutathione, selenium, lipoic acid, um, milk thistle, all of those things really powerful. Um, Anti-inflammatory support would be the, some of the stuff we talked about earlier, boswellia, curcumin, resveratrol, um, Chinese skull cap, all really wonderful additions. Um, sulforaphanes are from broccoli sprouts. They're incredibly powerful for detox. So those are just some of the core things. Um, I usually give people a fish oil or have them eat fish. Um, to get anti-inflammatory. And I'm a huge fan of spore probiotics. So those are kind of the core, core things that most people would want to take at a bare minimum. Okay, let's see. So I'm going to go just another five minutes. So I've got just a time for another question or two. Nicole asks, what's the recommended testing for Lyme um, if it's been undiagnosed? I'm a huge fan of Igenix. Igenix is very expensive. And I'm so sorry, I don't have any control over that. Um, there are, uh, Vibrant has a Lyme test that's a little more affordable. I do still feel like Igenix is the gold standard. So if someone really has been around and they want a diagnosis, I will go with Igenix because I'm going, I know I'm going to get the right answers. So I would just bite the bullet, get the Igenix test. Um, but if you can't afford that and need testing, you could do a regular Western blot for Lyme on a conventional lab. The yield can be negative unless you got bit by a, a, a East Coast tick, um, but still worth trying that. And then, like I said, Vibrant um, does a Lyme test that's very good and a little bit more affordable as well. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Um, have I seen patients develop liver disease? Um, positive, she has positive or someone has positive AMA um, mitochondrial antibodies, which have been in liver disease and had, so what I see, I see your list of uh, Lyme and Bartonella and MCAS, peripheral neuropathy, et cetera. You poor thing. You've had it all, huh? Um, so uh, what I find is Lyme is a, a definite trigger. So is mold for TGF beta, which is a driver of autoimmunity. So frequently we see someone who presents um, with autoimmunity, but the real trigger or driver of that is Lyme or mold or some of these chronic things. So not always can we reverse autoimmune disease, but sometimes we can. And the one hope for reversing autoimmunity is going to find what is that trigger that triggered your positive antimitochondrial antibodies and trying to reverse that. And like I said in the beginning, it's often one of two buckets it's toxic load or infectious burden. So if one of those buckets is the issue, then taking care of that bucket, and of course it's more complex than just, you know, it's more complex than it sounds, but that's the direction you would go in reversing autoimmunity. And I've seen miracles um, as long as you get to the root cause and try to reverse that infection or toxin. 
Hey, Tony, glad to have you join us. Diagnosing mold colonization on top of toxicity. Okay, so this is a great question because we can have mycotoxins in the urine which show exposure and can show colonization. Um, Great Plains oats will do the furans as part of their panel of fungus and those are usually related to aspergillus. Um, so uh, that's the, the way we can do it is we, if we see some of those markers on the Great Plains oat or on the urinary mycotoxin test, those are good indicators that there may be colonization. And then I ask them about symptoms, if their gut's bloated or if they if sinuses are congested or things like that. And we can treat any of those locations with antifungals or um, antifungal herbal supplements and biofilm disruptors, which are usually key as well. Hey, Ben, uh, lymph uh, fluid test, fine needle aspiration. Let's see, where'd your question go there? Accurate, cytokines worth testing. Um, so lymph fluid test, um, you know what? That's not something I do in my clinic and I'm not super familiar with that. Um, so I'd love to know more, but I don't know if I can answer you um, well on that topic. Um, cytokines, I do uh, cytokine panels on LabCorp and also um, precision, let's see, um, diagnostic solutions, I think does a cytokine panel. These can be helpful because if you see a lot of IL-6, IL-4, you kind of know the, but it's not like we have one, well, there are drugs now that treat some of these cytokines. So if you're looking for like Dexapant or some of these drug therapies, it can be helpful to know. But um, I agree with you, they're a little nonspecific. I think that's a great question because Sometimes I do it once or twice to prove that the patient is definitely cytokine driven. And I think that's probably what we'll see if we would test all of our long haulers um, and see what's going on. I'm guessing their cytokines would be elevated on the panel. I think that's exactly what we would see. Okay. Um, oh, thank you for your thanks. Um, CD4 is so high in a child. So this last question, Catherine, um, I'm guessing you mean C4A, she, you put CD4A, but I think C4A would be um, probably what you're looking for there. That's a complement split product that we see elevated with the mold exposure. Now there's other things that could cause that, but very frequently it's a recent mold exposure. So I would guess that there might've been an exposure somewhere for this person you're asking about. So, um, well, everyone enjoy this beautiful weekend. I am so glad you took time out to join me. Um, this will be recorded. This will be on my YouTube channel, which is another thing I didn't mention at the onset. If you have not gone to the YouTube channel, just search for Dr. Jill Carnahan. You're gonna find loads and loads of interviews. All of my previous Q and A's are there. And this is all free. So go there, watch whatever you want to watch, share with your friends. Um, and please do subscribe. That way you'll be notified when I put new content out. And I will just end this Friday with happy weekend to you. Um, love to you all. Thank you so much for joining me today. We'll talk soon.